know, I'm going to be, uh, for the next couple of messages that I preach, I'm going to be preaching out of the book of Genesis. And, uh, you know, it's the first book of the Bible. So even today, I'm going to be giving you uh, a lot of information. Uh, I'm going to be uh, sharing a lot of stuff, and some of the things that I share may challenge your perspective on uh, certain scriptures or what they could mean, uh, or maybe even give you a broader perspective of things. But don't worry, I promise you, I'm not going to preach any heresy. And, uh, but you need to know the Bible is a rich, rich book. It is a rich book. It is the Word of God, and there's, there's treasure in its pages. And it is available. In fact, what you discover, what you get from this book is only limited by your hunger and your desire for more. If you're happy with, you know, just a surface reading of it, it's fine. You will be blessed. You will make it to heaven and, you know, you live a great life on earth. But, you know, there are people who want more, so they dig a little deeper and they find out even more things. It is truly like a treasure. The Bible says uh, in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the glory of kings to search out a thing. So God actually sometimes conceals things in His Word. Uh, Bill Johnson says, uh, God doesn't hide things from us, He hides things for us. So there are things in God's Word that, he, that are concealed. It is for His glory to conceal it, because it is for the glory of kings to search them out. Because the kings that he's talking about are you, his royal priesthood. When you discover the beautiful things in his word, there is a glory that comes upon your life. There is a richness that fills your spirit. So the word of God is a rich, rich book. Don't be afraid to, to ask and to look or to delve into the wonders of this amazing book. Don't be afraid to, to question. God allows you to question. We are not like some... Some belief systems where you cannot question. If you question, you know, you should be killed or you should be... Our God allows us to question. He doesn't just... It's not just a... You know, there is a degree of faith. But it's not just a blind faith. Don't be afraid to ask and look for things in the Bible. Don't be afraid to question what you read. Because there are many people who have actually questioned the Bible and in the questioning, they have discovered the truth and the treasure that is hidden in it. The people like uh, Josh McDowell, who was a lawyer, who set out to actually disprove the Bible. Disprove the Bible and as he was looking for evidence and facts, he found out, wow, this book is true. And today he's a devout Christian. Uh, people like the, astro, the famous astrophysicist uh, Hugh Ross, who wanted to kind of prove that the Bible's uh, take on creation and, and all of that was wrong. And uh, it didn't make any sense. So he's a scientist and he starts to go through it and uh, research and stuff like that. And today he's a devout Christian preaching about, about the Word of God and about creation according to the Bible. So don't be afraid to question. Don't be afraid to delve deeper. There's just so much. In it. So today we're going to be looking at the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible. Like I said, I'm going to be giving you a lot of information. So, you know, what, uh, just kind of uh, flow with me, you know, get what you can, what you cannot, don't worry about it. Your salvation is, uh, is, is still, still on. And uh, the Genesis basically means the coming of being into something, of something, the coming of being of something, or the origin, or the beginning. So, the book of Genesis highlights where it all begins, where it all begins, how it all came into being. Uh, Genesis, the theme of this book is the sovereignty of God. Genesis, the first part of the book, Genesis chapter 1 to 11, covers four events, which is uh, creation, uh, the fall of man, the flood, and the Tower of Babel, and then Genesis chapter 12 to the end, talks about four people, which is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So this book starts with creation, and it ends with God's people getting into Egypt. And that's where you, you, it goes to the next book, the book of Exodus, which actually starts Moses' uh, story, Moses' call, and Moses' life. And uh, I'm going to start with reading Genesis chapter 1. 
verse 1 to 3, which is uh, most of my preaching, is going to be based on these this few, few verses. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. So three words I want to look at here. It says the earth was formless and empty. I'm going to look at the word formless and empty and the word was. And in the biblical Hebrew, the word used for formless and empty is the word tohu wa bohu. Everybody say this like you know it. Tohu wa bohu. Which is translated waste and void, or formless and empty, or chaos and desolation. It describes the condition of the earth before God said, let there be light, before God spoke into it. It says the earth, so it's describing that the earth was without form, uh, it was a wasteland, it was empty, void, and in a state of chaos. Chaos basically means no order. There was no order on the earth yet. And uh, the other word I want to look, look, at, look at is was. And uh, was is translated from the Hebrew word haya. Everybody say haya. <laughs> so that's a word we're all familiar with, right? So was is translated from the Hebrew word haya. And the same word haya is used in different parts of the Bible. And the only difference is in other parts, it is not translated as into was, it is translated into became. For example, in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, which it says, and man became a living being. So it is the same word, haya, which is translated into became. And in other uh, different scriptures as well, it's translated into became. So if I were to take that translation of the word haya and use it, in the first scripture of Genesis chapter 1, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth became formless and empty. So that would uh, indicate a time gap between the creation of the universe in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the beginning of the six days of creation in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 where God starts the six days of creation. And if it says the word, it uses the word became, there may be a time gap. And this is in harmony with scientific research and what science will tell you. Science will tell you that the universe is billions uh, of years old. And we don't have to listen to things like that and get all threatened in our faith and say, you know, that's, that's wrong, we cannot, uh, we cannot believe that. No, the Bible actually leaves room for such things. The Bible doesn't explicitly say, there, give us the age of the universe. So it gives us that room to actually look at science and say, yes, some of these things are true. The Bible actually does reveal such things. We do not have to be afraid of information like that because it doesn't necessarily go against what the Word of God says. Even in the Christian worlds, there are different schools of thought. There are some who believe, there are Christian scientists who believe in an old universe based on what the Bible teaches. And there are some who believe in a young universe based on what the Bible teaches. And that's free, free for debate. But it doesn't take away from the fact that the Bible is the Word of God. It doesn't take away from the reality that God created the heavens and the earth. You know, and uh, we, because we live in an age where we are constantly bombarded with new scientific discoveries and, and, and things that come out. And we should be able to, as Christians, we should be able to look at these things and not feel insecure about our faith. Oh, no, that can't be, you know, because this is what I, I've been taught, this is what I think. No, we should look at things like this, these discoveries, and know that, hey, the Bible does leave room for such things. There, there is a possibility that it is true. There's a possibility that this is actually revealed in the Bible. One of the, the Bible, in fact, is, is a book that, you know, when at, at a time when people were talking about how the earth was flat, the book of Job talks about how God sits on the circle of the earth. It talks about, it describes the shape of the earth. 
in, in a time way before when people never knew what the shape of the earth was like. So there are a lot of things that the Bible does reveal and it's just up to us to kind of discover it, don't be closed up to what we hear and what we see because there are a lot of things in the Word of God that we can, we can kind of learn from. Amen? But uh, the problem is when we look at, we kind of confuse scientific fact with scientific theory. When scientific theory is taught as scientific fact, a theory basically means this, a tentative insight into the natural world, a concept that is not yet verified, but if true, would explain certain facts or phenomena. So, there are a lot of theories, scientific theories, that are presented as facts. So we should be able to know how to discern those things. The Big Bang is a fact or theory. Evolution. Theory. Those are theories, but many times it is taught to us as if they are scientific facts. So we should be able to question certain theories because they are, as what it, it is, they are certain facts that might be true might be true and might explain certain things, but it's tentative. We don't have hard evidence for it yet. So, somewhere between um, the creation of the universe and the beginning of the six days of creation, the earth became empty. The earth became uh, uh, chaotic or, or desolate. And uh, we are up to the... To kind of, it's up to you to kind of research further and see which school of thought, you know, it indicates that there was a huge time gap between the uh, why, why the earth ended up in that state is because maybe there was a huge time gap between creation and the time when God starts the six days of uh, creation on earth. Uh, another beliefs, belief that uh, is common in the Christian world is that Satan and one-third of the angels were cast down to earth. So the earth became void, chaotic, a wasteland. And it, because they were on the earth. So, and Jesus also says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And this might also explain why Satan happened to be on earth when God had his perfect garden. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I know you all are looking at me it's strange, but don't worry, we are getting somewhere. So, the earth became formless and empty, darkness covered the deep, of, deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. So God looks at the chaos, God looks at the darkness, He looks at the disorder as chaos is defined to be, and it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, over the situation, God speaks into the chaos. God speaks into the darkness. God speaks into the, the disorder. And order starts to enter the earth. And light starts to come into darkness. And formlessness starts to take, take form. Now, why am I sharing this? It's to give you a picture of a biblical reality. Darkness, formlessness, emptiness, disorder is the state of things before God's Word comes into it before God speaks into a situation. Chaos is the natural state of things before order comes to it, or the state of things where there is no order or force exercised over it. And uh, if you study these things, this is known as the law of entropy. Everything leans towards corruption, leans towards chaos. Nothing left by itself will move towards order. Nothing left by itself will move towards order. A yard left by itself will not become a garden. Trust me, I've tried it before. It will not become a garden. Children left by themselves will lean towards mischief and chaos. You cannot leave kids alone in a, in a place for a year and come back and all of a sudden they automatically just by themselves became more polite, more disciplined, more ordered. No. They would become chaotic. Everything left by itself will lean towards chaos. A car that is left by itself with no force or order exercised over it does not stay that way, but it will break down and rust. How many of you know that? Z had no idea, right? So the point is this. Order does not occur randomly. It doesn't just 
happen. This order does not just become ordered by itself. No matter what the evolutionists, evolutionists say, I can, I can put some pieces of metal, springs, a whole lot of things on the ground, and no matter how long I leave it there, and no matter how much the wind blows and how it rearranges itself, it will not become a watch. And let me tell you, you are much more sophisticated than a watch. You are much more sophisticated than a supercomputer that, that man has built. And you are, and it's because you are an ordered being. You didn't just happen. And because I, there is order in my being, in my, I look up and I know someone or something or some force greater than I exercise force over me to bring that order about. Amen? Because order does not just occur randomly. So every time you see order, you know that someone exercise force uh, authority in that area and brought that order about. If I'm walking through a jungle and I'm cutting through the grass and the trees and the lalang and, and the vines and, and going there, and all of a sudden I come to a clearing and I say, wow, here's a clearing with nice rose bushes, trimmed bushes, manicured grass and stuff. I wouldn't, none of us would in our minds think, wow, this just happened randomly we will immediately know that the reason it is like that is because someone has been here. Someone has exercised force, authority in that area and brought order in a place of disorder. So the, the flip side of that is every time we see disorder, every time we see breakdown or chaos, be it in our schools or our government, in our society, it's because someone in a position of authority has defaulted. Someone in a position who, who had been given a position to exercise authority in a particular area has defaulted or abused that authority. That's why we have chaos. The earth is the way it is today. There are things that are not right. There's disorder, there's chaos in the earth today because God left the earth in whose charge? In God gave man authority on the earth. So if you don't see order in a particular part or a country in a certain place, it is not God's fault. It's because man has defaulted in the authority to act and bring about order into that place. Amen? Because God gave mankind authority on the earth. So God... In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God blessed them. God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So this indicates that God didn't bring the entire earth into order. The Bible says He planted a garden in the east of Eden, and in that garden, the garden was a place of order. A garden was a place created by God, a perfect place where men walked and talked with God, where men learned from God, where they received from Him. But He didn't, make, he didn't bring the entire world into order. From the garden, men were supposed to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. And be fruitful, everybody say fruitful, multiply, fill, subdue. So these are not four words describing one responsibility. This is an order of the way things should move in our lives. Be fruitful first, then multiply. If not, you're going to multiply your unfruitfulness. Be fruitful, multiply once you multiply, then you fill, and then you're able to subdue. Amen? So learn to be fruitful first. And the very fact that the word subdue is used... Uh, shows that there were things on the earth that would not subdue is from the word kabash, which means bring into subjection. Bring it under authority. Bring into subjection. And the very fact that God uses this word goes to, say that, that goes to show that there were some things on the earth that would not willingly bow down or willingly uh, surrender to man, it would not be easy that man would need to exercise authority over it and would need to subdue these areas 
on the earth. But this was before there was sin. But this was before there was, there was violence and murders and wars, and this was before the fall. So God definitely wasn't expecting man to subdue using those methods. How was mankind supposed to subdue? By the authority that God had given them. By the authority that God had placed on their lives. You see, creation will recognize the authority that God had given to mankind. Creation recognizes the authority that God had given to mankind. And why were there things that would not uh, submit themselves to mankind, that man would need to subdue? It's probably because, as I mentioned earlier, the devil was cast down, one third of the earth, and we see how he could influence certain things. But the devil could not come against the authority of man. So as long as man knows their authority, everything that they, everything that they encounter will have to bow down to that authority. Amen? We have God-given authority. Uh, when, uh, when Jesus walked the earth, He walked with authority. The demons recognized His authority. He didn't even have to tell them who He was he, or whether He was the Son of God. They immediately recognized the authority that was on His life. That's why He was able to subdue all those things that came against Him. Amen? And one of the most powerful tools of authority that you and I have is the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Now I want to bring this to you. If, if there's an area of your life that is in darkness, that is chaotic, that is not going the way you think it should go, that is not in order, maybe you should start walking in the authority that God has given you, maybe you should start taking authority over those areas of your life because God has given you that authority. You know, something powerful happens when you speak God's Word. It says this, the Spirit of God was hovering, hovering above the water, waiting for the Word of God to be released that it, the Spirit of God might move to bring about the will of God. Then God said, let there be light, and the Spirit moved. In the same way, the Spirit of God is hovering over your circumstances, over that family situation, over that problem, over that financial situation, waiting for you to believe, to stand on, to walk in the authority and declare the Word of God, that the Spirit of God might move and bring the will of God into being in your life, in that situation, in that circumstances, in your life. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12 says, I am watching over my word to perform it. God is watching over His word to perform it. God is obligated to perform His word. There's something powerful about, about the word of God. One of the most powerful tools of authority that God has given us is His word. Amen? And I'm going to take you to Ezekiel, which is a different scripture Chapter 37, verse 1 onwards. So Ezekiel has an encounter with God. And in that encounter with God, in that vision, he writes about it and he says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord. And he set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. So God brings Ezekiel on a journey, and he sets him down in this valley, and it's a valley of dry bones. It's a hopeless situation. It seems like a hopeless situation. It seems like a situation of death where there is no life, a situation where, where there nothing can be done about it. You know, there may be areas of your life right now that, that God may be causing you to see. And it may seem to you right now that this is a hopeless situation. You're not going to see change in that area. This is an area where, where there's just so much of death and, and you know, this thing, may, nothing you can do naturally that's going to change this area of your life. And it says God set him down in the midst of a valley. And sometimes God 
allows us or sets us in the midst of a valley, not so that we might experience defeat or experience the pressures of the valley, so that we might know the power of God that even in the midst of the valley, He is able to get us out. Amen? God allows you to go through certain things. I don't say God causes you to go through. He allows you to go through certain things, not that you might know defeat, but that you might know the victory that you have that is in Christ. The authority that you have to get out of these situations. Amen. That you do not have to live a vic- as a victim, that you can walk out of this victorious. Amen. And then he says to Ezekiel in, in verse 3, he says, He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? What was God asking Ezekiel? Do you think the situation can change? Can the miraculous happen and transform the hopeless situations in your life? And I believe that's the question that God is asking some of you here today. Can that situation that you think is hopeless, that you think is a, that's for you is like a valley of dead and dry bones, can this situation change? Can a miracle come into your life? Can what the doctor has declared over your body, over your health, be changed? Can what the bank is saying about your finances be transformed? Can that door that seems shut be opened? Can this situation change? Son of man, can these bones live? You see, God always asks questions, but not because He doesn't know the answer. It's because we need to know the answer, because the answer often reveals our heart, often reveals where we are with God, where we are with our faith and walk with God. And Ezekiel's answer was the classic Christian answer. Oh Lord God, you know. God knows. La. God knows. La. God knows if I'll ever get out of this situation. God knows if my life will change. God knows if this financial situation will transform over my family. God knows if my children will ever change. God knows if my health situation... You know, and another thing, Christian, like God willing. If God wills it, then I'll get out of it. You know, it all sounds very religious and, you know, and very, very holy. But let me tell you, it is also very wrong. Amen. Many years ago, we were, uh, I went to pray for a woman who, was, uh, who had cancer. And uh, as I sat with her and I said, do you believe that Jesus can heal you? And Jesus wants to heal you. And her, her response to me was, you know what, Pastor, I'm ready to go. If God wants me to get, God gave me this cancer, He has a reason you know, if God wants to take me, I'm ready to go. I'm going. You know, if He wants to heal me, He will heal me. If He doesn't want to heal me, I'm ready to go. And it, is, it was so difficult to get through to her that, you know, cancer was not God's will for you. You know, God wants to heal you. Never once did people come to Jesus and Jesus says, uh, let me see, let me think about it. You know, it is, your, it is my will that no, actually it's God's will that you suffer this, this, this disease, that you be blind. It is God's will because it's going... You know, God wants you to go through life blind because He has a greater... Never once did Jesus justify a sickness or a condition. When Jesus met those circumstances, those situations that were torturing and tormenting people, He immediately said, I am willing... I will, and he cast it out. He dealt with it immediately. But Christians often try to justify our circumstances, making it sound all very good and holy, but it is not biblical. It is not the heart of God for you. Amen? It is not God's will for you to be poor and broke. It doesn't bring glory to God. He says, I will bless you and through you the nations of the earth will be blessed. How are you going to be a blessing to the nations of the earth if you are walking in poverty? That is not God's will for your life. He has a greater plan for you. Amen? And it starts with you believing. Oh Lord God, you know. That was Ezekiel's answer. 
And this is what God says to him. Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord to these bones, Surely I will cause bread to enter into you, you shall live. I will put sinews on you, bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put bread into you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. A couple of things I want you to notice here. He says to, here God is there with Ezekiel, right? And he says to Ezekiel, you prophesy to these bones. He doesn't say, look here, watch me, Ezekiel. Let me show you my power. Let me show you my glory. Let me show you who's the boss. Let me show you what I can do. Bones, this is what you need to do right now. No, he, he says to Ezekiel, you prophesy to these bones. You do it. God is there. His word is there. But he says, you use my word. You prophesy. You speak to this bone. You see, God wants... Men, you see, we all know that God is all-powerful. We all know that God is able. To God, all things are possible. But God wants you to see that you, believing with God, standing with Him, trusting in His Word, you too can walk in the authority and power that He has given you. Amen? We knowing God is powerful is helpful. But we knowing that we are powerful in God is even more helpful to us. Amen? So in the midst, if you're in the midst of a valley, don't wait for God to do something. You already know. He says, speak my words. You already know what God says about your situation. You already know what God says about your health. You already know what God says about your financial situation. You already know what God says about your relationships. Don't wait for God to come and do something. Start speaking. Start prophesying to those bones. Start prophesying to the situation. Start prophesying to your family situation. Start prophesying to your financial situation. Start prophesying to your, to your body, to your health. This is what the word of the Lord says. Amen? Amen? He says, you do it. You prophesy to these bones. Say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to this, speak. He doesn't say, in that situation, he doesn't tell Ezekiel, okay, Ezekiel, speak to me about the bones. Speak to me about the bones. Tell me how terrible this situation is. How bad this problem is. How dry these bones are. And you know, many times as Christians, we spend half our lives, our prayer life, our spiritual lives, talking to God about the bones in our lives. Amen? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Oh God, this is such a terrible situation. Oh God, I don't know how, how I could have ended up in this kind of... Lord, why is this happening? God, you know about my mother-in-law. She's like this. God, you know about... Listen, God created your mother-in-law. He knows her. You want to tell him about your mother-in-law? He'll say, tell me about it. God... Look at my boss. You know, look at what's happening. You know, the situation is happening and we give God a narrative of all that is going on. That's our prayer life. But God is not saying to him, speak to me about those bones. He's saying, you prophesy to those bones. Amen? Matthew chapter 21, verse 21 to 22, it says, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to this fig tree, but you will also say... To this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and it will be done. You will say to this mountain, be removed and be cast to the sea. Not You will say to me to remove that mountain and cast it into the sea. Speak to your mountains. What is the mountain that is standing in your way right now, in your life, in your circumstances? You need to start speaking to your, to your mountain. Stand on the authority that God has given you, the dominion. Remember, creation recognizes your authority. The demons recognize your authority. It's about time you start recognizing the authority that God has given you and walk in power and victory. Amen. 
Tell your problems how to behave. Don't let your problems affect or infect your behavior. You tell your problems how to behave. You tell your financial situation how it should behave. This is what the Word of God says. He shall meet my needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. My God has opened up the windows of heaven over my life and He's poured out a blessing so huge there's going to be no room to, to, to contain it. That is how my financial situation is going to look like. You don't belong here. You are a temporary inconvenience, a speed bump, a blimp on the radar. You're going to go. This is temporary because this it's what the word of the Lord says and prophesy into the situations in your life. Amen? And Ezekiel says in verse 37, So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together. Bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered over them, till, and, and, but there was no breath in them. As he prophesied, as he spoke the word of God over the situation, as he spoke, not as God spoke, God's word in your mouth is still God's word. Amen? As he spoke into that situation, things started to change. Bones started to rattle, flesh started to come. As you speak God's word into your circumstance, into your situation, I guarantee you, you will start to see change. You will start to see change. The Holy Spirit is hovering as He hovered over the darkness over the earth, waiting for the word of God to be released that He might move and bring the will of God into being. The Holy Spirit is hovering over your situation, over your life, waiting for you to believe and release the Word of God into the situations, that He might bring the will of God into your life. Amen? Things started to change. But it ends with, but there was still no breath in them. And then he goes on, keep prophesying, keep declaring, keep saying. Also, he said, prophesy to the bread, prophesy, son of man, say to the bread, thus says the Lord God, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O bread, breed on the slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and bread came into them, and they lived, stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Keep declaring. Keep prophesying till you, till you see life. Keep prophesying till you see the change come into your life. Keep declaring the word of God till you see the circumstances transform. Bow their knees to the name of Jesus. Amen? You know, there are things going on in your world. And as you start doing this, you know, this is a powerful tool of authority. Jesus walked in authority. When Jesus faced the devil... He didn't say, Father, get rid of this devil. The devil is tormenting me. He didn't cry out, Father, send your angels, your warrior angels to fight this devil. He defeated the enemy by simply saying, For it is written. For it is written. He stood on God's word. He stood on God's word. Today, there are circumstances in your life that the enemy may have brought about. There are circumstances that you may be facing in your life that is totally looks impossible. But listen, there is a scripture, there is the word of God for that situation. You need to be able to look at those situations and say, yes, it seems like this now, but it is written. My God shall supply all my needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Yes, the doctor said that, but, for, but it is written, My God is my healer. By His stripes I am healed. So body, 
you are healed. Yes, it is written that the situation about my, my, my children are that way. Uh, uh, I'm facing this when my children are struggling. They're going through this and you know they're far away. But it is written, me and my household shall be saved. So I'm going to declare and claim it over my life, over my family, over every circumstances. And let me tell you, God is true to His Word. It is not your responsibility to bring God's Word about in your life. It is His responsibility. And when you release and believe and stand on the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will move and bring the will of God into being. Amen?